Okay, so thank you so much for coming. I see a lot of empty faces, which is nice. Makes me feel less nervous. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so I am an MVP student, which means that last summer I did a field practicum for the completion of the degree. Um, so a lot of this is going to be talking about what I found while I was there doing my field practicum. Um, and the topic is underlying social conflicts drive human wildlife conflict in like Ebia County, Kenya. I had some weird technical difficulties with this earlier, so hopefully it's okay. It's behaving. Cool. All right, so um, why like Hebe? Why did I go here, of all places in the world, to study human wildlife conflict? Um, well, mostly because that's where I found a connection. <laughs> Not really any better reason than that. But um, Lycopia is very biodiverse. It's considered a global hotspot for bi biodiversity. Um, it's it's a frequent destination for people interested in seeing wildlife roaming freely. Um, and I had an interest in biodiversity conservation, but also in agriculture. Um, when I came to the MVP program, I knew that I wanted to study either small scale farming um, as a livelihood strategy, or um, really, I, I knew the idea would be studying uh, sort of life at the nexus of biodiversity conservation and uh, farming. So um, that is mostly what Lycopia is. Um, and I was connected to Impala Research Center, which is a 20,000 plus acre uh, wildlife conservancy. It's privately owned in Lycopia County, and it has a research center based out of the middle of it, owned by Princeton University. So I was connected with them through my academic advisor, and um, together we developed a proposal based on some complaints that um, neighboring communities had made about baboons. So, um, why human wildlife conflict? They're really significant, uh, these conflict events, uh, mostly because of the detrimental effects they have on people. Um, they can lead to food insecurity. If you own one acre of land, that's your entire crop for a season. An elephant or a group of elephants can come in and in one night take everything. So, you're, they're completely putting you back at the drawing board for that entire season. Um, so if you're living off of that as your subsistence, then it's gone and you're hungry now. You can also experience a loss of income. If you're selling these at market, then again, your entire crop is gone. You need to find something else for, for money now. Um, there are physiological and psychological effects. In this context, I say physiological because some of the farmers that I talked to, they were spending the night, um, all night, on their farms in these small huts, um, awake, just lying there waiting for text messages from neighboring farms about elephants or baboons or what have you coming through and cooperating. So um, obviously, if you're not getting any sleep, you're really stressed out. <laughs> and you're really tired all the time. So they're experiencing all these effects. It leads to a lot of stress in their day-to-day -day life. And then if they are hiring young boys, which is often the case to guard the farms, um, those boys experience low attendance rates in school. And overall, all of these effects can compound to lead to really long-term effects on the economic development of a country, especially in a country that's really rich in biodiversity. So I want to tell you a little bit more about Lycopia and about the specific area where I was working. Um, I wasn't all over the county because it's quite large, but um, in total there's about 500,000 plus people in the county. Um, the nearest large town to where I was is called Nanyuki. It has about 50 to 60,000 people depending on the migration patterns at any given time. <laughs> Um, and the largest ethnic groups are Kikuyu and the Maasai pastoralist communities. So the Kikuyu are primarily farmers, and again, Maasai are pastoral or semi-pastoral, living in sedentary communities, but taking men taking the cattle around the county. Um, most of the land here in this area is still controlled by white settlers, and that's a really important thing to consider when you're looking at this case. So I want to give a little bit of a history about the land tenure here, because I think that it's led to a lot of the complications that the area is experiencing now. 
Um, so let me zoom in on this a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. Okay, so in the late 1800s, um, mainly British settlers came to Kenya. It was a um, European protectorate and then became a British protectorate after World War II. Um, they were in search of new opportunities. It was seen, you know, similar to United States history where uh, European settlers saw the West as a new frontier for economic growth. Um, Brit the British saw Kenya and the rest of East Africa as a new frontier for economic growth. So many people came and they were gifted land. Um, those who were in power gifted tracts of land, they split it up and they would give it to people based on their connections or their existing wealth. Um, in the 1920s, after World War I, a lot of vets were granted large tracts of land and actually the land that Impala, the research center I stayed at, is on today, was gifted after World War I. So, Three men were given that land after World War I, and they, their families still own it today, still in the hands of white settlers. Um, in the 1950s, Kenya experienced its Mau Mau uprising. This ultimately led to its independence in 1963, and in the 1970s, new president Jomo Kenyatta broke up the land and gift, gifted most of it to Kukuyu. He was Kukuyu and that was a dominant ethnic group, and that's who he decided he wanted to um, give this land to. So in a couple slides, you'll see a map of Laikipia, and you'll see uh, about half and half of the land is government or Kukuyu-owned land, and then half is um, white descendant land. Um, in the 1990s and early 2000s, land tenure changes were um, underway, but in order to hold on to that land that they had had for now a hundred plus years, um, white settlers made a bid to keep their land uh, for the benefit of wildlife preservation. So it, the government did grant them this right. They were allowed to keep the land as long as it was turned into a conservancy, which is why there are so many now in Laikipia. Um, so now and today, Tenure still favors Kikuyu, but white settlers definitely possess the advantage because very few whites own most of the land. Okay, so this is that map I was talking about, and I'm going to zoom into it. Um, this was taken from a study where someone worked in these two areas. Those areas are not, def they're not relevant to mine, but I thought this was a really excellent map because um, in other maps, the small-scale farming land is designated as government land, but I think it's really important to see it for, for the breakdown of what it really is. So this darker brown is the small-scale farming. This is the larger-scale ranching, this pale yellow. And ranching is another word for the conservancies. And then you have some other areas that are mostly just traveled by pastoralists because they're swamps or just not, they're just not very productive landscapes for agriculture. Okay, so like I said, the largest tracts of land are private ranches or conservancies. Um, small scale farmers are working on government owned or white owned land. Actually about five of the 10 farmers that I primarily worked with on this project were renting their land from some elderly white women who didn't even live in the country anymore but still own the land and we're using it as extra income. Um, the few small, a uh, few large scale farms, sorry, are basically just horticulture farms and they do not stay, their products do not stay in Kenya. So their products are going to European markets. <laughs> and the habitat, really important to know if you're looking at uh, biodiversity. Laikipi is actually a Maasai word for the treeless plain. So in its most healthy state, Laikipi is acacia scrub. It looks like a big grassland savanna. Um, there's two major river systems that most people collect their water from. And now, today, there is severe degradation. And that comes from um, both the farming, unsustainable farming practices, but it also comes from 
um, the Maasai herds growing larger and larger. Um, in recent years, they've the, the ratio of Maasai men to the number of cattle is, is stretching. Um, you'll have one man who owns hundreds and hundreds of heads of cattle, and unfortunately, because of the way the land was divided up, and because they, for the most part, cannot graze on conservancy land, um, the farms and the Maasai are sharing the same land, and the vegetation that remains on those stretches of land is being eaten up by the livestock. So there's a lot going on. <laughs> um, as the MVP people know, uh, it's complicated and uh, context specific. Okay, <laughs> so um, the methods that I use for this project, uh, the biggest one was participant observation. I spent a lot of time just sitting and listening and watching and learning, um, asking people about their practices, just observing what they would do on a day-to-day -day basis. I asked questions about, you know, how much labor did they use? How much money did they need? What, what were their operations like? And what were their home lives like? Because most of the time I was with them on the farm, but they did not live on the same tract of land that their farm was on. Their houses would be elsewhere and they would walk or take a motorcycle to their farm. Um, I also used semi-structured interviews and I only ended up getting 12, but the reason that, the main reason that I only got 12 was because of logistical and financial issues. But the other part was that um, studies have shown in the past that when you're using um, semi-structured interviews, if you're starting to get the same responses after a handful of them, you probably don't really need to keep going because you're just going to get the same answers. And that's exactly what happened. Almost everybody gave the same exact answers. Um, and the other big thing that I used was camera trapping. So I had camera traps deployed on these farms that I worked on for a total of um, six plus months. Um, a couple of them had to be moved, but there are thousands and thousands of days worth of camera traps. So a lot was captured and a lot wasn't captured, um, <laughs> which I'm gonna talk about now. So there were nine cameras on seven farms, and when I was planning out where I was going to put these, I decided that this was sufficient because these farms are one acre or less in size. So one camera trap could essentially capture the whole field. Um, and I also placed a couple on one large scale farm, which had a baboon issue of a different kind. Um, I could spend a whole presentation just talking about what was called the baboon restaurant. Um, if you have questions, please see me after class about that. But no, just kidding. Um, so they, that farm, I wanted to look at to see if they were having similar <laughs> issues or if what they thought was a solution was actually working. So I, I put some of my cameras there. Um, these cameras had night capabilities. So if anything was moving in at night like elephants, then I would see that as well. Um, because my suspicion going into this was that it wasn't really baboons at all, but that elephants, even though they came in less frequently, were doing more damage overall. Um, and then in the beginning, when I set out to do the camera trapping, I had thought that I would just toss all the photos that had humans, because I was expecting all of these pictures to have wildlife. But um, it turns out that the wildlife didn't come. So um, all the photos with humans ended up being kept because now I'm taking sort of a different perspective on this, which is that the heavy presence of humans on the farms on a day-to-day -day basis kept the baboons away. So here's some pictures of me watching the baboons at the baboon restaurant and putting up a camera trap. Um, my technicians were awesome. They helped me out so much. They were so much fun. And <laughs> I'm here I'm putting a camera trap on a utility pole. And they very kindly found a ladder for me to climb up there. <laughs> and they're all helping me so I don't fall off the ladder. Um, so the major findings were these. And um, wildlife values, of course, were a big feature in the semi-structured interviews. I wanted to know how did people feel about the wildlife they were seeing on a day-to-day -day basis? Did they feel like they had any benefits? Did they, did they like them? Did they 
educate them with a neutral. Um, all participants saw value in wildlife and all participants said they wanted the wildlife conserved for future generations. But not a single person said they reaped a single benefit from wildlife. So they saw the value even though there was no benefit to them directly. Another big thing that I learned through the participant observation, which I definitely wasn't expecting going in, was there was a lot of unsustainable water consumption happening. Um, believe it or not, and it's such a large number that it's, it's, you kind of have to like stop for a second and really soak it in, but one acre farms were drawing in over 80,000 liters of water from the river every day, and some on the hour every hour for 12 hours. So you do the math, it's a lot of water coming out of one river that everybody is sharing, the conservancies, the farms, and the wildlife. So in addition to that, and at the same time, droughts are becoming more frequent and they're becoming lengthier. So climate change is wreaking havoc here and it's compounding with the fact that people are just drawing water from the river with little governance over it. <laughs> um, and natural watering holes on the conservancies themselves were reported less frequent as well. Um, the human wildlife conflict events, uh, there is a government scheme for <laughs> providing compensation in theory. Um, on paper, there is, in practice, it doesn't really exist. There are a couple offices across the county for personnel who belong to the Kenya Wildlife Service who are supposed to be at people's beck and call for when these wildlife conflict events happen. However, there are so few of them and there's so little funding and there's bigger issues at hand that most of the time uh, farmers reported that if you were to call the people, they would say that they would try to get out in a couple days, but then months would go by and you would never get a response. So they weren't coming out and the compensation scheme, unfortunately, it was written up such that unless you owned more than an acre of land, you would not be compensated, which, which took all of these small scale farmers out of the picture. So the people who were suffering the worst impacts from human wildlife conflicts, they didn't get anything from the compensation scheme. Um, so, and, and of course, as I alluded to before, in the six months that I had the camera traps up, there were, <laughs> there were no visits by the wildlife. So what was happening? You know, there's, there's something going on, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. I thought this quote, I've, I've said it to the MVP before, but um, it really stands out to me. It's just from a semi-structured interview, and someone said, if an elephant is shot and killed, you go to jail. If an elephant kills me, nothing. No one's there to help their family. No one's there to compensate the family. It's just brushed under the rug and people look the other way. So they're feeling, they're feeling like they're invisible to the government. There's a clear neglect happening. There's not a recognition. No one's even coming to say, I see that this is a problem. I hear you. Um, and again, this unsustainable water use was leading to huge issues. Water is being drawn faster than it can be replenished, which in, in the long run is going to change the watershed entirely. It's going to change the way it functions. So if all of this water during periods of drought is being taken from the river, that means that eventually enough is not going to be evaporated back up and it's not going to come down in the future. So there, there I'm not a hydrologist. I will not pretend to be an expert <laughs> in hydrology, but um, at the same time that I was doing this work, a Princeton professor was out there looking at the same issue, and he was interested in implementing some kind of low-cost technology solution that could help farmers um, change their water use practices. So this is something that's being looked at. It's not, it's not something that, um, is just going to go ignored, which I'm, I'm very relieved about. Um, but I think the big thing for me that I saw coming out of this is that even though it's not happening yet, eventually people are going to start fighting over the water that's available during droughts, and then the people in the wildlife are going to be fighting over it. So you're going to have a lot of different groups and a lot of different interests fighting over one very limited resource. <laughs> and as we all know, the water conflicts that go on all around the world, regardless of the context, they can be really detrimental 
to entire populations of people. And then, of course, uh, again, no human wildlife conflicts in the six months. Um, but there was a daily human presence, which could mean that as long as there's enough people on the farms on a day to day basis, baboons aren't going to show up. Um, I don't know if it takes one person, I don't know if it takes five, but maybe just someone being there, someone being present that could shoo them away is enough to deter them. And um, it is important to know also um, that the cycles of crop production were totally normal during the six month period. So, you know, from start to finish, there was seeding, there was planting, there was plant growth, there was harvesting, uh, repeated several times throughout the six months on all of these properties. So there were crops being grown that would have been available to baboons had they showed up, but they just didn't. So what does this all mean? Um, it's likely that, oh, okay. <laughs> It's likely that social tensions are the real problem here. Um, farmer Maasai conservancy tensions compound and they lead to stress. And in other cases that have been observed around the world, when these social tensions are happening, animals are sort of a scapegoat. Um, they're just the easiest target to put the brunt of the stress on because the social tensions can't or won't be solved for whatever reason and wildlife are just easier. And like I said, that sort of goes along with what others, what other authors have suspected in the past based on their experiences. Um, but human wildlife conflict isn't ruled out. Um, there could have been an issue with the methodology. There could have been an issue that maybe there were better, higher quality crops being grown elsewhere in the same area. So the baboons went there. There's a lot of possibilities for um, what could explain why baboons didn't show up. Um, so in the future, I really hope to see some kind of wildlife governance improvement. Um, of course, the human wildlife scheme, it lacks funding. And so maybe compensation in this case is just not an appropriate solution. Sometimes compensation schemes are really helpful. Sometimes they're not, and this just may be one of those cases where it's just not working and it needs sort of another look. Um, if it does remain, it's going to need to be more inclusive. I mean, the people who are suffering the most from the human wildlife conflict shouldn't be the ones that are left out of the compensation scheme. If anything, mm -hmm. they should be the priority in the compensation scheme. Um, of course, they need to see people on the ground. Just somebody who can come out and say, I see you, I hear you, I know it's a problem, I can't necessarily do anything about it, but I know it's happening. Um, and maybe the solution is an effort to include farmers in the money-making business of wildlife. Um, farming is not a lucrative uh, livelihood. <laughs> Most of us who have worked in developing areas where people are dependent on farming know that you you don't get much out of it. It's, it's subsistence and it gets you a little bit, but it doesn't get you far. And most that you ask would say, yeah, I, I wouldn't do farming if I had another alternative. So maybe a solution is to include the farmers on the process of bringing in tourist cities conservancies or bringing in research scientists to the conservancies where they're working and they're safari and they're they're exploring their own research interests. Maybe there is some way that these small scale farmers who have to live on the barriers of the conservancies can benefit from what's going on inside of them. Um, and of course, resource misuse is a huge factor. Conflicts over water will become more intense if something doesn't change. But again, like I said, there is a project now going on that's low cost. And as long as that research project receives funding, at least for a couple years, we can really see if it's helping. Um, I can give a little bit more of an explanation about the project at the end if anybody is like really interested in it. Um, and conserving water could be used as a point of synergy for all groups. If all groups realize that water is an issue for them or the lack thereof is becoming an issue for them, maybe this is a point where everybody can come together and say, okay, we don't agree about A and B, 
but C is the lack of water and we all need that. Maybe that can be some way to bring people together and facilitate a collaboration for improvement. So what I would see is next steps for at least myself in this particular research would be to address the methods used, maybe do a little bit more experimentation and see how to improve the camera trapping process, um, maybe visit more farms, see how things changed last year that were different from years before that may have affected the data that was collected. Um, and of course, explore the effects of that new water project, see if it's working, see if anything's improving, and then facilitating collaboration between groups. Um, in the past, the conservancies actually used to host workshops that were supposed to help farmers um, figure out low cost solutions for human wildlife conflict. But for whatever reason, that workshop has come to an end for the foreseeable future. I'm not sure if it's a temporary break or if it's a lack of funding, but something similar to that, a, point, a meeting point where the conservancies who possess so much power and wealth in the small scale farming communities can come together and talk about what they see as the issue. And with that, I would like to thank you all for coming. <laughs> um, and I would welcome questions at this time.